there. If you're new here, thanks for stopping by. Every Friday, we sit down and chat about a case that we feel has an important message that can help others in similar situations, save a life, change mindsets, or even contribute in changing laws. But before we dive in, here's a little side note. Every bit of information, images, or footage was compiled from what's available online, or if we were lucky in some cases, from the very people closest to the case. All opinions expressed are our own. We mean absolutely no disrespect. So don't click out and stay a while. And welcome back to this week's episode of The Final Scoop with Crystal and Roger at Pretty Criminal. Dozens of women have been murdered before cops could intervene. More than a million people in the UK are stalked every year. One in five women and one in ten men. However, by the end of 2017, only 806 stalkers were brought to justice. There is clearly something wrong with this picture. Even for a math-challenged person like me, I can see that these numbers just do not add up. The ratio of a million to 806 means that there is a huge gap in the system. Do we need more laws in place to give law enforcement officers more power to stop a stalker before they could cause irreparable damage? Hell yes. This is a time for mobilizing, for lending a hand, giving your support to people and organization who are trying their best to face this horrendous crime. And who with enough power, enough support, enough strength and courage, like David, they will defeat this Goliath. And uh, we have Roger with us again for the final scoop. Hello again. Did you have a chance to think about what this case meant and any lessons, anything that you can share with us, any insights? Yep, there's uh, quite a few things to get into with this one. There's, there's the perspective of what's interesting about this and what challenges our perceptions. There's the what kind of lessons we can learn. There's a few uh, interesting facts that came up when we were doing some research into these. One place to start is this week we were kind of umming and ahhing about which case to do this week because there are there were four that are quite similar that have uh, a lot of things that are similar in common that we can learn from and that are also unique in their own ways. So aside from Claire's case, there was three others. There is Jane Clough's, there's uh, Holly Gazzard's and Molly McLaren's. For me, selecting Claire's is about um, what we can learn maybe more from that one out of the four. And it's to do with that whole thing of what challenges our perception of stalking. And with her particular case, I think it comes down to just the sheer levels that her stalker would go to, his level of commitment. He's at a a slightly different level. So if you look, for example, at his actual physical stalking in the street, he is, unlike other stalkers, he's not lurking in the background. He's right behind her. He's talking to her. He lays hands on her at just outside work he shoves her in the tube station he attempts to kiss her grab her by the face and kiss her on the train there's also the fact that of the the victims in the different cases claire actually changed her address and he still managed to track her down there is also the lengths that he went to to get the murder weapon i mean that 
he had to go to a foreign country, he had to fill in documentation, there was a waiting period and an examination. He then takes the risk of trying to smuggle that back into the UK. He's just at a different level, maybe, compared to some of the other stalkers. There's so much to unpack here, but the very first thing that I think we need to make sure that uh, those cases that you've mentioned that are very similar to Claire's, they were cases that have happened in the UK to young women. Through the research, we are coming across so many to add to the list that this season is just not going to be enough to cover yeah. the amount of victims that we are coming across. So we, we have to pick one, but at the same time, we don't want to appear that we're making light or not touching upon the others because they are important and what we had talked about potentially maybe towards the end of the season is maybe looking at what the victims families of these other different cases have done because in all of these cases they've all the victims family have responded in different ways in raising money raising awareness or in getting inquests to try and change institutional behaviours or laws, or whether they've started their own organisations because they think that there's a gap there. So fingers crossed towards the end of the season as a sort of resource, we will go back to look at the, the victims' families and how they are trying to keep them alive and make, bring some meaning to their loss and what they've been doing and what resources are out there. I think one season of 12 cases is just not going to cut it no. because of the amount of victims we're coming across. But I think what would be interesting for us to look at at some point is to, based on what you just said, that some families have, uh, like Alice's family, they have created foundations and trusts and they have been actively participating in trying to change laws. Yeah. What would be interesting to see is go back and look at their foundations, look at what they've done, look at what laws they, they've participated, compare year on year what's been going on and what, if anything, is changing in the way that the problem is being looked after. Yeah, because each family has been touched in a different way and has responded in a different way. So, for example, Jane Clough's family, I believe that through their inquest, they managed to get one of the laws in relation to bail conditions changed. But I think even they weren't happy with the level of change that they that they wanted to keep on pushing forward. So there's, yeah, there's a lot. Each one's respond, been touched differently, responded differently, you can kind of maybe group them by the three types like fundraising, the inquests and laws, and then their own foundations and the likes for how they're trying to respect the memory and deal with the problem where there's gaps in the system. You just brought up an interesting point where you're talking about Jane Clough's family with the with regards to getting the law about bail uh, changed. What would be interesting to look at is what year this was done and what year some of the other crimes that have happened where the perpetrator actually was free on bail like we just saw in Claire's uh, case that he was not free on bail awaiting sentence only once he was he was it was twice yeah and this is the reason why we do mention the other cases because there are uh, there's sometimes sometimes there's tie-ins where there's, it's something common where you can see this is repeating across several cases and sometimes there's a specific difference or nuance that stands out you think ah that should be mentioned so it doesn't really work for us to say because we can't talk about these cases enough that we shouldn't mention them there's good reasons to mention them totally i i completely agree so in terms of the lessons that can be learned from this particular case or cases even, there's kind of uh, three parts that stand out and then there's like a little bit of useful background information like when we talked last week about uh, how to check behind you. When we were just doing research, we came across stuff like how to check if someone's following you, if you're driving or if you're walking. So 
I think I think maybe if we just start there. So the kind of interesting facts that just came lurking up whilst we were doing the research was one of the things that they were saying statistically about when a relationship ends and some form of harassment starts. One interesting statistic was that about 50 percent of the uh, harassment ends or drops off after about two weeks. Mm. So that is a potentially useful fact for people to try and gauge whether the person that they've finished the relationship is, should they be worried if they're a stalker in terms of how persistent the behaviour is? Has it, after that two week period, is it, is it about the same? Has it escalated? Is it dropping off slowly? Would you say, would you call that obsession still? Or is it because somebody's heartbroken and they don't know how to deal with that pain? So then for two weeks, they try yeah. to regain control somehow and they categorize it as harassment because it could be trying to ring you, text you, message you on Facebook. You know, you know people use that phrase, they'll get the message. Mm-hmm. So it seems to be that statistically 50% of these forms of harassment either end or start to drop off after two weeks. But uh, we need to still take it seriously because there's always a chance of the problem escalating. Yeah. How would you handle that or what? It obviously depends what the what the form of harassment is. Obviously, if it's escalating, 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 then obviously you need to start taking record taking records and start taking appropriate steps, like like a personal safety plan or something. But the, this brings me to the other interesting fact that came up when I was listening to one of the psychologists. And he was saying that once it becomes clear to the stalker that the, the relationship is kind of over and you move into the stalking phase, he was talking about how you want to not get tricked into communicating or responding to them. Because what he said was, this new type of relationship, the stalking relationship, in their mind comes to replace the normal kind of relationship that was there before. So it's almost like there's a void by the normal relationship ending that the stalking fills the place of. And if you're responding to it, like if they're messaging, messaging you and you're replying back a lot saying, leave me alone or getting pulled into conversations, you're feeding so thing. that's a way for them to keep you close or to keep you present in their life or them being present in yours. Yeah, I think there's a lot of advice out there that, you know, try, you know, try not to engage with them. People have heard that before. What was interesting was just how he framed it, how he said that, you know, this one relationship was there and now it's gone. And now something has to fill the void and it's the stalking and it's, if you're engaging with them, it's almost like a different form of relationship, which actually is one of the most interesting things about Claire's case. Because if you look at the wording of the the text or what he's saying to her, instead of just with some of the other cases where they've said it's over and the person's begging and pleading, in other words, in some form they've accepted that either it's over or in jeopardy. In Claire's case, the stalker is phrasing his words to imply that it's not over, almost delusionally as if you don't understand what you're saying, you're in love with me, you just don't realise it because you're some silly young girl was one of his you're phrases. stupid little girl. Even the records that he was personally keeping, like diaries and or poems that he was sort of like writing, they all clearly implied that he felt that the relationship was still going, going on. on. But imagine the level of delusion because they only literally went out on free dates over a period of three weeks before she stopped it. Yeah. Right? So free dates. He was already obsessed by the first date. Yeah. And it, it's, um, I mean, coming from a foreign country, that is a problem that, with him we can't actually see if he has a a background in stalking or domestic abuse whilst in the other cases uh, particularly um 
Holly Gazards and Molly McLarens, there very clearly is a history of abuse, which they couldn't have known about, which is one of the problems. I mean, how if someone does have such an issue, how can you possibly find out about it? And let's not forget that when he actually asked Claire out, he was right in the middle of a divorce from his wife, who was in Slovakia. Now, we don't know the reason why he divorced that wife. Let me just take a leap here and, and speculate that I don't know the reason. So I can't claim to know the reasons. I tried to research it. I don't know her name. I can't find any information on that uh, relationship. And if there is any history there. However, if I was to speculate, he started working for Harvey Nicks almost a year prior to him asking Claire out. Then in January, he asked her out. And then he's right then at the, in the middle of a divorce. Oh, can we speculate that maybe his obsession with her had already started prior to that? Because it sounds a little bit weird to me that, okay, he went on that one date and suddenly he's obsessed. I think there's he was seeing her because they worked in the same place. Yeah. He saw her at work. He knew who she was, right? So is there a situation that he might have followed her before? That he might have been stalking her quietly before? Or had he even been stalking other people in this time period? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a, unfortunately, it's a big black hole in her case that we don't know about his history. But at least in the case of Holly's and Molly's, you can see that it is it's very clear in Holly Gazard's case, there is four incidents of domestic abuse just prior to her stalker meeting her. And in the case of Molly McLaren, even though it's not uh, physical abuse, you could say that her stalker was showing like the stepping stone uh, to getting there. So he physically spat in an ex-girlfriend's face, which is you know, one step away from slapping somebody. He had uh, caused destruction of property by knifing another girlfriend's tires. He'd made death threats. So he was on his way there, you could say. Mm -hmm. This conversation kind of brings us on maybe to the second point of note. So if the first point of note is just trying to find out about somebody's background. And as we talked about previously, one of the common traits of the stalk, these type of stalkers tends to be the speed with which they try to get into a some form of committed relationship. Mm -hmm. Like lock, lock it down before yeah. it, it goes away from them. At this point, before we go further, I need to state because... Maybe there are some of you who are uh, in that mind frame or questioning yourself, like, who are we to be able to give that kind of information or speculate? We are no expert in psychology. We are not expert in criminology. However, we have a vested interest in it. And I think, you know, sometimes it's also important that people like you and I take an interest into the different subjects to be able to identify what's happening because these problems happen with you and I. We could be relatives yeah. or friends of a person who this is happening well, to. We could be the, the individual who is on, uh, on the receiving end of that. And if we don't have the tools to identify those, we won't be, we won't know how to deal with it. So I don't think you need to be an expert or a psychologist to be interested in educating yourself in those matters. Uh, well, no, I mean, that's, it comes down to that argument. Uh, there's like a philosophical argument, if you like, about um, comments from authority. It's like, if you don't have a PhD, can you comment on something? And it, uh, a lot of the people that I like listening to on a wide range of topics are, are saying, well, that's a, that's a flawed argument. The, the, the quality of an argument or the quality of the information should stand on its own, irrespective of who says it. So if you if you think about um, that film with the uh, working girl where there's a clip in it where they're talking 
the owner of of some companies talking about a bus that got wedged underneath a bridge and he's saying how do we get it out and then a little kid in a passing car says why don't you just let the air out the tires so then obviously it comes lower and they can get it out and all these engineers hadn't figured it out i mean that's the less that's the from authority he's just a kid but the quality of the statement stands on its own it's correct unfortunately these are sad situations these are not things that people want to think about these are grim situations that are happening to to real people's lives and some people might think that it is morbid to take an interest in it but i for one sort of disagree because because of the fact that i'm on this quest of knowledge i am maybe better equipped at noticing the red flags i'm more educated to protect my daughter who might go through a situation like uh, like that anyone could be could fall a victim of this kind of situation sure and you have to being a realist about it just look at the statistics what did they say one in five women and one in 10 men depending on which statistics you go by and of course bearing in mind how many go unreported so even if you go with that statistic of one in five women and one in 10 men then in theory you know people who have this problem. Yeah. Also, another way to look at it is the more people that get educated on it, the more people that become aware of this problem, the less likely a perpetrator will have the space and the environment to commit their crimes because we are more aware. We see you. We know what you're doing. I mean, it's recognised as a crime now, but just like domestic abuse. I mean, if you go back a few decades, look at the, with each decade, look at how that was viewed and what level it had to be at for it to be considered a crime. So it's a society. It's useful to have things like this that help, as we say, challenge people's understanding of what stalking is. Because when you see how far reaching it is and how many people are affected by it, then it's society's view towards it starts to change. And then behaviours, laws, attitudes, everything else starts to follow pace just as it had decades past with domestic abuse. Perpetrators of crimes, whether it's um, sexual assault, whether it's domestic abuse, whether it is uh, stalking behaviours, the it is a perfect environment when things are taboo to talk about. So, because if something is taboo to talk about, it's not talked about in the open in public forums. It's not talked about amongst a circle of friends or family members because it's it's frowned upon to talk about it. It gives them the perfect combination, the perfect environment to thrive. So the more we talk about it, the more we burst that open. Yeah, bringing it into light, increasing awareness, helping change the public and society's perception of it. It's the same as like, as you're saying, like people coming out who want to talk about it. It's like people who've been sexually assaulted. I mean, the Me Too movement has now made it a place where people maybe feel a bit safer to come out and talk about things. So also, it's in that same kind of basket of things that we're trying to move forward to deal with as a society. Yeah, just to play the devil's advocate as well. I mean, we also have to be very aware that when we're talking about these issues, that we also have to not turn a blind eye to the fact that bringing the subject to light can also be an open can of worms because it also allows on the other side, on the flip side of the coin, for people to falsely accuse. And that is also not a good thing, you know? As we saw in last week's episodes, for example. Exactly. Or, as is obviously so blatant to the whole world, the live uh, cases that is currently going on of uh, two actors and one extremely famous um that i'm sure you've all heard lately so that's 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 a clear show of of how to keep ourselves balanced on that scale so that we don't 
open that can of worm. I mean, just going back to the lessons that we can learn from this case, the first one, as we touched on, was trying not to go into new relationships with too much speed and trying to find out something about their background. In the case of Holly Gazard, I believe that she, one of her friends knew him from school and his reputation, but by then it was a bit late. Most people are dating people within a certain location or who come out of a certain group of friends. I mean, that changes with Tinder and these online dating apps, but if they're adding you on Facebook or whatever, you can look on their Facebook feeds and get some feel about things that are going on. Moving on to the second point, and we touched loosely loosely on this before in Travis's case, which was the trying to avoid being a contributing factor towards the problem. Because whilst Claire was clear in persist and persistent in her saying no and setting of boundaries, in the case of Holly Gazard and Molly McCrarran, it looks like there's a two-stage triggering event that becomes the excuse to escalate into murder and violence because as we've touched on before with people of a certain psychology not everybody who's borderline personality or whatever becomes a killer as whilst it's a thorny issue we just need to kind of just look at it just to be certain that we do things in the right way that we're not making a mistake that could cause us a bigger problem and in this case in the case of Holly and Molly, it's the first stage of the triggering event tends to be when they finally, finally try to split up. It's the how and the when of how they did it. So whilst the advice is there that if you don't feel safe with somebody, you know, do it in public. In the case of Holly, the final, final splitting up was on Valentine's Day. And in Molly's case, it was on her birthday and they were both in public. And I believe one of the stalkers, uh, one of them says verbally at the time to the crowd of her friends, implying that he's feeling embarrassed by it. And the second one, I think later on lists it as a reason. Mm. So the how and the when of of how you set your barriers and make your breaks is important that you don't let it become potentially a triggering event that can escalate things. Yeah, but it's also important to say here that we are in no way victim shaming and we are not implying that they were the reason of their own murder because the responsibility and accountability of that solely lies on the person who perpetrated it. I think what you're trying to say also is that we can inadvertently contribute to obsession. Yeah. Whether that person takes a small reason and runs with it and amplifies it and tries and makes it worse than they should be, that's totally on them. Yeah. Which goes back to two points. The one point that we were saying previously that how the stalking relationship, if you like, feeding into that can be part of a part of the problem in how you're responding. And the second one is just to what you were saying about the victim shaming. We have to bear in mind point one that neither of these girls had any knowledge whatsoever that the person that they were with had a history of stalking or violent or destructive behaviour. Because if they did, which is why point one is so important, they would have probably dealt with the situation of the, the splitting up or the relationship in general. They would have dealt with it differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then the third part of the kind of lessons that we can extract from this case or the, the other cases is the institutional failures. So in the, um, the two cases of Jane Clough and in Claire's, there's the fact that the murder took place whilst the person was on bail, which you can say is a form of institutional failure. Then in Claire's case, there's also the issue of 
with the police, how the, um, the female policewoman who was dealing with it had one day's training, was handling 25 cases, even though, by all accounts, this was a lovely person who was absolutely distraught when she heard what had happened to Claire. It's still, from the police's side, there's there's something not right there. And it, this was one of the points that I thought was quite interesting that Rachel brought up in a previous episode when she kind of asked me when we were talking about a dedicated sort of unit like homicide or robbery like they have in the American police system and she said is there something like that for the UK and even though we've been researching and looking into this for some time the fact that you can't or the average person in the street if you ask them that they can't clearly say yes there is or Yes, you go to this helpline. Whilst we kind of are aware that there's certain resources there, the fact that we don't go, yeah, I'd just go to the stalking department or I would call this number. There's whatever resources there. People aren't really aware of where it is, oh, what not, it is, how it operates. Or it's not clearly defined in the system. Yeah. So there's whatever they have. People don't really know what it is, what it can do for them how it works they don't necessarily know uh, what the weaknesses or the failures of this are because one of the things that we get to with the institutional failure side of things is if you know that something only works a certain way or it has certain weaknesses you can take certain actions yourself to try and accommodate that which is why this kind of personal safety plan or safety planning is an important part of what you should be doing if you have a serious problem with a stalker because as we're seeing sometimes it's a mistake just to assume that the police will I've gone to the police the police are handling it because you've essentially given away your power you're just thinking they're going to take care of this now what else can I do what else can I do and the personal safety planning is something that you can do for yourself changing your phone number potentially changing your address, letting people know. One of the interesting things from, I think it was Molly McLaren's case, was that the parents actually printed out a picture of the um, stalker's face and handed it out to neighbours, mm -hmm. just so the neighbours were aware that this guy's a problem, this is what he looks like. If you see him hanging around, call the police or let us know. I think that was a very smart move. Didn't stop what happened, but it is a step that we can do to yeah. protect ourselves because, of course, we can't be vigilantes. No, we can't we take can... we, we can't take things in our own hands and... and uh... But we can all get a fret. We can all go with friends to and from work, go with friends to or from certain places. It changes the situation around. It makes it difficult. It makes it more complicated. I mean, in, in that particular case, uh, I believe that was Molly McLaren, a passerby was too late to save her, but potentially came close. I mean, it was too late then, but had he been maybe there at the very beginning of the attack, maybe that would have changed. If there had been two or three friends present, it could have changed the whole dynamic and they might be alive today. I think it's also recommended if you are going out, especially at night, try to go with someone don't leave a friend behind if you go together you go in together you come out together as in go walk into a nightclub together you do not leave without your friend or you do not let your friend go because you just want to stay back if we all adopted this policy it would help in trying to keep us at least safe because there have been other situations where Friends have gone together into a club and the one person wanted to leave, the other one doesn't want to leave and the person who either went first or stayed behind ended up being a murder victim. Sometimes the sweetest baby face looking person can be a vicious killer. So I don't want us to fall in the stereotypical, oh, this person looked like they could be dangerous and this person might not and then you end up trusting the person who might appear not to be and this was a wolf in sheep's clothing yeah
The unfortunate truth is that not everyone you meet in life will have good intentions. And the hardest pill to swallow is that the people who have bad intentions for you often act the nicest. It can be so difficult to work out if someone truly cares for you or if they have bad intentions lurking behind the facade they put up. As much as we all might want to see the goodness in others, you need to always be on the lookout for red flags. You should be able to pick up on some signs that someone might not have the best intentions. Some of the signs that someone has bad intentions include when you catch them out in habitual lies. They focus on their own needs and wants. They make you feel uncomfortable and when their body language just seems off. These can be from people who you have just met in your social circle to someone with whom you are involved romantically. The person you are concerned about will most likely do everything they can to make it seem like they have your best interest at heart. But if they really do have bad intentions, then there will definitely be signs that you can pick up on. For example, they constantly lie. A person who is trying to put up a front that they care about you will constantly need to lie to get away with behavior. Once someone starts covering their tracks by lying, it all just spirals out of control and their lies become bigger and even more obvious. Someone who has good intentions in your life would not need to lie to you. Yes, we have all been guilty of telling white lies now and then, but this should not be a habitual thing and it should not be to and if you stayed with us throughout this entire episode thank you for listening we'll catch you next week for our next case of stalking a crime with pretty criminal in the meantime stay safe <laughs>